My son Cam is studying overseas this semester. He is in the UK. He's in Oxford. Okay, not the Oxford you normally think of school-wise. Uh, he is in Oxford Brooks uh, University over there. And a while ago, uh, when my wife heard that he was heading over, she began to kind of plan and scheme around his plans and, and stuff. And so she started saving money without letting me know that she was saving money. And so uh, it was, uh, I, I used the term in the first service, uh, she was stealing money from the grocery fund. Apparently that's not correct. She was diverting money from the grocery fund. <laughs> That, that's a softer way to say that. But, you know, she would go to Publix and, and, uh, and do the charge and pull out kind of like $50 and squirrel it away. Go to Target, pull out $25, kind of squirrel it away. And she had been doing this for, for about a year. And so last fall, she presented me with two airline tickets for spring break to go to England. And she's like, and you're taking Rylan with you. And so uh, I got to take my other son to go visit my son who is studying abroad and to say I was uh, blown away and surprised, that's kind of an understatement. I, I was actually uh, stunned uh, that she would do this and that she would save up uh, the money to do this. So last week, that's where I was. Uh, we were over in the UK. Uh, we went to London. Uh, Rylan and I did some of the things that he's never done in London before because he's never been there, some of the no normal touristy stuff. And then we went to Dublin. Uh, and then uh, from there, we went out kind of to Western Ireland. Uh, this is the cliffs of, uh, I'm going to mispronounce it, but Moher, 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 something like that. Uh, they're cliffs. They're really pretty. Uh, and so we had a fantastic time out there as well. And then we came back to London and uh, went to a couple uh, football matches, and, and we just had a blast. One of the stops we did the first day that we got, or the second day that we got there, Rylan and I, because Cam hadn't joined up with us yet, is we stopped at Westminster Abbey. And you, we did the tour of there. So for me, it was like going back. And when you go through something again, you, you get to see things and, and hear things that you maybe didn't the first time. Uh, but if you're unfamiliar with Westminster Abbey, they used to bury people in the church. And so uh, you actually walk over the graves of people as you're touring through it, and they tell you who these people are. You get to a part that's like the poetry and composers sections and all that kind of stuff, and uh, I looked down, and here was the tombstone that I am stepping on, and it was George Frederick Handel. Uh, he was buried there. And for me, instantly, I'm reminded of my dad. Uh, and I called Rylan over. I was like, Rylan, look at this. He's like, who's that guy? Right? Which some of you are probably saying right now. Uh, he wrote uh, the, uh, the Messiah. And my dad would listen to that every Christmas season. Uh, and so uh, it was pretty cool. It was a, kind of a cool moment to explain that to my son. And he acted like he was interested while I was talking to him about it. So it was, it was just a great experience for us. Went to Dublin, and we're walking down the street, and we come to Christ Church, and we go, hey, let's go in and check this place out. And so we walk in there, and again, we do the tour of Christ Church, and they give us the headphones, and you start touring around uh, the church, and you get to the inside of the sanctuary. And they, they tell you on the tour, they're like, uh, Handel's Messiah was first performed here. And so this is like the day after being at Westminster that we're here, and I'm like, no. So... It's really quiet, very, and, and, and I couldn't help myself. I'm listening to the headphones, and I didn't realize how loud I was, but I was like, no way! You know, and all of a sudden everyone was like looking at me, and my boys had been wandering off, otherwise they would have been aptly embarrassed. Uh, and I found them, I'm like, did you hear that? And they're like, what? Yeah, they, they didn't really have the same response I did. As I was listening to the headphones, they started talking about the organ uh, that they had installed there, and immediately I was transported back to my home church growing up, a Wheaton Bible church, and I can remember distinctly sitting, listening to the organ, listening to the hymns, sitting with my parents, and I found myself sitting in this uh, worship center just so thankful for the church that I'd come to know Jesus in, for the church that had taught me through the hymns and some, through some of the old songs uh, in that regard, and I was just kind of overwhelmed uh, with this thankfulness. I, I, I even remember singing songs that we thought, you know, they were the new songs of the day, but they had been written in the 60s and uh, 70s. And in fact, there's an older song that was released in 1971 that we fashioned the next three weeks around. Uh, it's called, the song is called, Because 
he lives. Because he lives. The first 15 words of that song uh, say this. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, to heal, and forgive. Will you pray with me? Father God, thank you so much, Lord, uh, for the opportunity that we had together as a group to sing songs that teach us, that remind us of your goodness, that remind us of your pursuit. Lord, so many of us sitting in this room, you have changed our lives. Uh, You have moved us from death to life. And it is such a joy to come in and to sing about your goodness and your grace. Thank you, God, for that chance. Lord, as we open up your word right now, uh, I pray that you would just move me out of the way, that you would communicate the things that you want communicated. Holy Spirit, we give you free reign to encourage us, to challenge us, to convict us, to do your work in our heart this morning. Our hearts are yours. It's in your name, Jesus, pray these things. Amen. Our passage today is Luke 19, 1 through 10. You can turn there in your Bibles or on your phones. Uh, It's going to be a different Sunday in that the Scripture is not going to be up on the screen for you. We're going to do this in picture form today. So uh, if you want to follow along with the words, you'll probably get it just by watching the pictures, to be honest with you. But here we go. Artist rendition. Uh, Verse 1. He, Jesus, (laughs) entered Jericho and was passing through. The historian uh, Josephus describes Jericho as the richest part of the country at that time. Uh, It's called the Little Paradise. In fact, it was known at that time as the City of Palms. It had incredible advantages in climate, uh, in soil, in production. Uh, It was a commercial and military center as well. It also kind of sits on the road from Damascus to Jerusalem. In fact, it was the last stop for some of the larger caravans of people that were heading to Jerusalem for festivals, such as Passover, which we find Jesus heading to Jerusalem uh, currently in our, in our account here. Uh, he is heading there for Passover. So it's not hard to imagine that this would be a place where someone could gain a ton of wealth, where they could make a lot of money. And so when these caravans came through, it was custom for the people to kind of line that main street. And as they would come through, what their hope would be would be to buy from them uh, things that maybe they couldn't get in Jericho or uh, to be able to sell to them so they could make some money and perhaps even encourage some of them to spend the night in their home so that they could rent out a room to them. And so this was... Jericho at the time of Jesus. You probably know Jericho probably brings up memories because of the Old Testament, right? Joshua and the battle of Jericho and the walls came to dump, that, that one. So this is the same city right here that Jesus is passing, uh, passing through. And so there would be people in the crowd that have heard of Jesus. Uh, they had heard of him from reputation. They, they would probably be wondering, is he going to speak? Is he going to perform a miracle? Like, what's Jesus going to do here? Look at verse 2. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. <laughs> His name means the just or the pure. Uh, and as you can see, he's not really living up to his name here. He is the chief tax collector. This would be a, a, a status or a role or a job that he purchased from the Roman authorities. Now, Tax collectors, they could charge whatever they wanted to the, the common folks. They say the Roman tax was 100, uh, we'll use dollars, $100, and they could say, oh, it's, it's 150 for you, right? And then they would make the little extra uh, over top of that. And so they could determine how much they wanted to charge. And the people, they were powerless to uh, resist them. They couldn't because they had Roman soldiers backing them in this. And so uh, he was incredibly rich. Uh, In fact, the local Jews would have hated him. They would have ostracized uh, those who worked for Rome. There was a deep hatred for this kind of individual. It's it's really hard to understate that uh, in terms of how they considered. He was considered a traitor to his people. Verse 3, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not 
because he was small in stature. Are there any of you that are a little bit smaller that can understand Zacchaeus getting in the crowd and being like, I can't really, could you? Uh, why do you think he went to see Jesus? I mean, he's, he's wealthy, he's, he's uh, not really liked by the rest of the people in the town, he knows there's going to be a crowd. Perhaps he had heard of the conversion of Matthew or uh, Levi, uh, who was a tax collector before he became a disciple. Palestine wasn't that big, and it's not like tax collectors had a ton of friends, right? So perhaps they knew each other. And yet, Jesus was known as a friend to tax collectors and to sinners. And so Jesus evidently had a soft spot for people like Zacchaeus. A little more on that later. Uh, my boys and I uh, were, we, we, honestly, we didn't even plan it. We, we just planned our trip, and then we realized we're in Dublin on St. Patrick's Day. But yeah, right? So they got up early and they uh, went to the parade. I was older. I've seen parades before and uh, I slept in. And so uh, I found my way. I didn't end up finding them in the crowd of 500,000 people or whatever. But I did, did get close enough because I'm taller that I could see. But I did hear the people behind me complaining. There were a lot of Zacchaeuses behind me. And they're like, I can't see over this guy. I'm like, I'm sorry. So we, kinda, we can feel what Zacchaeus felt. Like, I want to get a glimpse of Jesus but I can't see him. And so, of course, he solves the problem. Verse 4, so he ran ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. Now, the sycamore tree in Israel in that time, it's a sturdy tree. It grows to about 40 feet. It has branches, thick branches that kind of uh, spread out, a short trunk, wide branches. It was literally a, a perfect climbing tree for him to get up. Now, you got to understand how unusual this would be for Zacchaeus to do. He's a rich man, and in that culture, for him to climb up a tree to, to see someone, it, it's kind of like he sets his pride down to get a glimpse of Jesus. Now, I'm guessing here, but I'm guessing that he wouldn't want the crowd to know that he was up there. Like, he's probably feeling fine, hidden up by the leaves, and yet Jesus knew he was up there, right? Verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up. Now, can you imagine that? He's seeing Jesus, he's got bird's eye view, he's looking at him, and then all of a sudden as Jesus comes to where he is in the tree, Jesus stops and looks up. Now, the rest of the crowd that maybe was there to see Jesus is probably like, I wonder what Jesus is looking at. And we're like, Whoop. you know, right to see Zacchaeus up in the tree. I'm guessing terror kind of gripped his soul as the crowd lifted their eyes to him. He, he's probably like, oh, I'm going to get ridiculed again. And then we see what Jesus says. He said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Jesus called him by name. You think the night before when Zacchaeus went to bed that he was trying to plan where around the route he could find and see Jesus? Do you think he was just hoping for a glimpse? Do you think in his wildest dreams he thought he'd have a conversation with Jesus? And Jesus stops and calls him by name. It's like, almost like they agreed, meet me at the sycamore tree. They had agreed ahead of time. Now, I'm going to call this a divine appointment. In fact, I, I would suggest to you that you and I have these divine appointments all the time. We just choose how we want to engage with them. Uh, let me give you an example. Thursday night, uh, I work with uh, our college and career students. We meet here. You know, students are showing up at like 6.30. It goes from 7 to 9. We have anywhere between 45 and 60 college and career students that show up on a Thursday night and hang out. Uh, we sit underneath the lid and do some worship, and then uh, we talk through biblical passages together. And so after that, kids hang out for a while. And by a while, I mean really late. And I, I love doing that, but I'm always, I'm, I'm realizing this, I'm older now. When I hit certain times, I'm like, whew, I am tired. Now, I was in a conversation with a couple guys. We were sitting actually on those couches right there and having a great conversation. And one of them looks down and says, oh my goodness, it's 1215. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I feel that everywhere. <laughs> like, I, I totally know it's that late. 
And so they're like, listen, we, we got to go to work tomorrow. Uh, we're going to head out. And I was like, okay. And so I did what I normally do. I went into the other building. I turned off the fan. I turned off the lights for underneath the lid. And then I came back in through here. I locked up this building and I went to my office. I grabbed my stuff and I headed out to my car. Now, I'm currently driving my son's Civic while he is uh, over in the UK, and my other son has my car up at FSU. And uh, it's 12.30, you know, by the time I had finished all that, and I got to the car, and I went to turn it on, and it was like, and I was like, ooh, because they had left. It's, I, I'm gonna, you might not come up here much at 12.30, but there's not much going on. Like, it is... Okay, unless people are up here doing drugs in the back, there is not much happening. <laughs> and so there uh, wasn't anyone there uh, at 1230 uh, on Thursday night. And I'm like, well, you know, I started running through the ideas. I'm like, I could walk home. Uh, I figured out it was a three-hour walk to my house. Uh, my phone was on, like, walking time when I came back from England, so I started getting these alerts when I got back, like, you need to leave now. Your meeting's in three hours. I'm like, traffic is really bad. And then I looked, and I'm like, oh, that has me walking the church. That's not happening, you know, kind of a thing. So I, I eliminated that right away, and then I was thinking, I could call my wife, who's a teacher and been in bed for three hours. No, probably not going to do that. Uh, I could go in my office. I have a couch in my office. I could sleep until the next morning, and maybe someone could give me a jump. But then I pulled out my phone, and I got myself an Uber. Now, <clears throat> the beauty about Uber, that's not my address, by the way. That's where the Uber was when I called him. Uh, but the beauty about Uber is they give you a, a time stamp of when you're, when you're going to get your Uber, right? And so I had eight minutes to get over the fact that I was spending an extra $30 to get home. And that was good. That was good for me to kind of process that before the guy showed up. But it is 1 o'clock when this guy comes to pick me up. And I am thinking to myself, I don't want to talk to him. I just want a quiet Uber ride. I want silence. I just want to go, right? And he pulls up, and I, I meet him right out kind of front there by the little lid. Uh, and he basically opens the door. I open the door, and he's like, hey, Tom, how you doing? And I'm like, 1 in the morning, dude. Really? And we have this conversation, and it starts with why I called him. And I was talking about my Civic when start, and we happened to be sitting in his Civic. And he's like, I never have problems with mine. And I was like, good for you. That's why I called you. Right? And then it goes to uh, why he works nights and what he likes about working nights. And then uh, why he was out here in Brandon in the first place. He had picked some up, up from Ebor and had brought them out here. And then our conversation was like, and then, you know, we get to cocaine use. Yeah, I'm, uh, U.S., Mexico border, fentanyl, um, and, uh, like, why people go out, and those that are looking for companion. And I'm like, holy cow, we are talking about everything. And as we're pulling kind of towards my neighborhood, I just have this overwhelming sense, right? And it's just two words. Tell him. Tell him. And I'm like, Lord, you've heard our, con like, where do I go from there? Oh, well, you know, you've been talking about cocaine use. Let me tell you about Jesus. But, but I, 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 I went to this. I said, I said you know what, I, I think you see this all the time in, your, in the backseat of your car. I said, we've talked about a variety of stuff. We've talked about cocaine use. We've talked about the eclectic amount, different people that are in Ebor City, those who go for different reasons, whether it's companionship, whether it's uh, to blow off steam, whether it's part of He goes, my theory is this. I think everyone's trying to fill a hole with those things. Like, just fill a hole in their heart. I'm like, you, you saw where you picked me up, right? And he was like, uh, no, what, was, what were those buildings? I'm like, you drove in through the electron, by the electronic sign. Like, how did that, not? anyway. I said, I, well, it was a church, and, and I, I actually worked there. And, and for me, I feel like that that, uh, that hole is a missing relationship that we have with God. And did you know that, that God provided a way? And I started talking about Jesus. And we got to my house, and he stopped at my driveway and it wasn't like he prayed the sinner's prayer or anything like that. He was like, man, that, this was a fascinating conversation. Thanks so much for sharing that. And I was like, yeah, hey, you know where to pick me up. You can meet me there anytime if you want to talk more. And he's like, yeah, okay. And I walked away. Now, I have no idea what God's doing in his heart. I just know that in that moment, I had to be faithful with that 
opportunity with that appointment. Verse 6, Zacchaeus responds, he hurried down and he received him joyfully. Now, the coming of Jesus to share in his home is a sign of fellowship and ultimately forgiveness. Um, <laughs> here's what we're going to find out. Not everyone likes a good redemption story. Look, look at verse 7. And when they saw it, they grumbled. Interestingly, in the Hebrew, the word, root word for grumble is very similar to the buzzing of bees. You can kind of sense that, right? It's very appropriate. Here's what they were saying. He's gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Now, not only the Pharisees, but the rest of the Jews would consider a tax collector was, would be a sinner. Uh, because he had extorted, he had cheated people. And so here you have the chief tax collector. So to spend such time in, in someone's home like that, uh, it would be as if you are, um, you are sharing in his sin or you are at least condoning his sin. Now the complaint that they had is both right and, and wrong. Zacchaeus is indeed a sinner. As we're going to see here in a second, his own remarks will show, but he's not beyond God's reach or God's mercy. But the truth is, this crowd has written Zacchaeus off. Which leads me to this question. Who in your life, when it comes to faith in Jesus, that you've been like, hmm, nope, there's no way. Uh, you, you've written them off. You look at their life from a distance and you think to yourself, there is no way. I mean, no way. They're so anti. And in your head, you're thinking, man, they're so far from God. There, there's, there's no ability for them to change. Now, here's the truth. You just can't see it happening. <laughs> you just can't see it happening. If there's a name that popped into your head, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd love for you to write it down. Whether it's in the notes uh, that you're taking or in your phone app notes section, just write that name down. Because Jesus doesn't write those names off, those people off. Now, we're not given much of this conversation. We're only given the result of it here at the end, the declaration that Zacchaeus made. It's, it's actually pretty interesting to me how the Gospel of Mark kind of formulated this because in chapter 18, just the chapter before, uh, a rich man had approached Jesus and said, how, must, how can I inherit eternal life? And Jesus had talked through the commands. Uh, and he, he, he only mentions like six of them. And the guy's like, I got those. And then he goes to the, well, great, now give away all your money and sell to the poor and, and get rid of all those things. And he wasn't going really at the money. He was going at the problem. The problem was he had put something before God. Uh, he, he, uh, he had brought a God before God, basically, and that was the root of his problem. And then Jesus makes a statement. He says, uh, it, it is really hard for a rich man to come into heaven, right? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to come into heaven. And it's amazing because the very next chapter, we meet a rich man to whom salvation comes. It's almost like Jesus saying, yeah, it's really hard, but it's not impossible because I am who I am. Verse 8, here's the declaration. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Now this was unheard of from tax collectors. Uh, they didn't submit to anyone. They didn't have compassion for anyone. Uh, they didn't give away money to people. They took money. And so uh, he didn't really, in before, would, he wouldn't confess a wrongdoing because they considered themselves above everyone else, outside of the law. So notice what Zacchaeus does. The first thing he does is he confesses. Uh, Zacchaeus acknowledges Jesus as Lord. He says, Lord. Now, this man, who previously wouldn't bow to anyone, recognizes that Jesus is in charge. This uh, chief tax collector readily submits to Jesus. Look what he does next. He makes restitution, which involves humility. 
After recognizing his failures, not only does he confess, but then he makes uh, public what he's done wrong, and he seeks to make amends for the wrongs that he's committed. I think sometimes one of the most painful things we can do in relationships is when we commit a wrong against someone is to ignore it or hope it will just go away, uh, ignore the damage that it does. What this does is this builds up resentment, this builds uh, and this eats away at the relationship. When we go and we admit, hey, I was wrong here, I need your forgiveness, I, I, I'd like to make amends, we become kind of like a cool drink of water on a hot day. We can bring refreshment, uh, we can bring healing. Uh, that leads me to this question, are there any hurts in relationships that you have that you've caused? Uh, my encouragement as we approach Holy Week is don't ignore those. If someone comes to mind for you, I encourage you to reach out, to call, uh, to set up coffee, to set up uh, dinner, uh, to go to that person and to make amends and just say, this is part of my journey of following Jesus. I recognize that my actions or, or what I've said has hurt you, and, and I just want to confess that to you, to make amends. You see, it's God's law that convicts us of our sin, our brokenness. It convicts us of the fact that we've kind of engaged in worshiping a different God. Zacchaeus here had broken the first commandment. He had loved something more than he loved God. And Jesus had come to deal with that. Look what Jesus says in verse 9. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. Now, from what others could see, Zacchaeus was beyond salvation. They would have picked him out in that question. There's no way the chief tax collector comes to know Jesus. If you had lived in Jericho, you would have written him off too. And with pleasure, because he probably would have, him or one of his minions would have cheated you out of some money. He, has turned, he had turned his back on God's word, on God's covenant people. He was a participant in Roman oppression. He was a traitor. He made the, backs, uh, the money off the backs of people. Uh, he loved money. He and the tax collectors that worked for him were the cause of so much pain. You wouldn't have picked him. He was the smallest man in town. And not just stature, but character. And yet, Jesus gives clear assurance of his salvation. He says, today. There is no delay in this. Jesus uh, is granting uh, forgiveness. He doesn't tell Zacchaeus, hey, okay, let's test this out. I got a few good works for you to do. I'll check back with you in 30 days, see how you're progressing on your journey, and we'll see if, you know, you've kind of come to being a better person. He just says, no, today, salvation has come to this house. There's a phrase he uses that can be kind of confusing. He says he is also a son of Abraham. And you might be thinking, well, he was a son of Abraham because he was Jewish, but the Jews had disowned him because of his work with Rome. And so Jesus declares him again a son of Abraham, but this time not by birth, but by faith. So despite his previous actions, his confession made him a man of faith. And so son of Abraham, the old has gone, the new has come. Jesus is saying there's a change that's taken place in Zacchaeus' life. And then Jesus makes a statement, and we get to the thrust of this passage. Why did Jesus come? It says this, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He came to seek and save the lost. Now, this is quite a statement. It's packed, packed full of goodness. First, we have this incredible uh, fact, of historical fact. The Son of Man has come. Uh, Jesus has come to earth. The Almighty has entered our world. The infinite has become finite. The eternal has invaded time. Theologians call it the incarnation. God and in human flesh. The Bible says, Emmanuel, God with us. God has come. His birth is different than any other birth in human history in that he picks the time. He voluntarily came in obedience to the Father's will. That can't be said of you, you and I. 
We didn't have a say. We didn't have a choice. I showed up in 1970 in Royal Oak, Michigan to uh, Chuck and Noreen Eichem. Like, I didn't have any say in that. That's just when I came. But Jesus came according to God's plan. Galatians 4.4 4 says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son. Son of man. It's, it's not just a title. Uh, it indicates Jesus' deity and his humanity. He entered in human flesh. John 1.14 says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We've, we see him in the New Testament. We see how he lives. He has lived among us. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called Miracles, and in it he says uh, this, The central miracle asserted by Christians is the incarnation. They say that God became man. For every other miracle prepares for this, exhibits this, or results from this. We believe that God became man. This is the central truth of our faith. In fact, this is the part of our faith that we kind of part ways, right, uh, with, uh, the, with Judaism and with Islam. Those, re those religions reject the notion that God had a son and that, son, that God became somehow one of us. But for Christians, it's impossible to speak about God uh, without speaking about Jesus because God became a man 2,000 years ago. At the heart of our faith is this truth. God has come down in the person of Jesus. Now listen, if you're new here, if you're just checking us out online, if you're, this is the first time you've ever come or you're wondering who Jesus is, <laughs> we believe he is God. So why did he come? Let's look at what he said. He came to seek and save the lost. Let's look at that statement for a second. Who are the lost? Well, it's us. It's men and women are lost without God. What does that mean? Isaiah 53, 6 tells us this. All of us are like sheep who have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. In other words, we are the lost. Uh, we, by nature, will go our own way. We, by nature, will kind of fill up that hole with things that we think will uh, satisfy us. And so we have run astray. No one has to teach you to run away from God. And so Jesus came to seek. He came to seek. If you, if you look, if you read through Scripture, you see this over and over. He came seeking sinners up a tree by midnight at Jacob's well. Uh, those caught in adultery, blind beggars, lepers, wild men living in tomb, self-righteous Pharisees who thought they didn't need him. He came seeking fishermen, politicals, radicals, physicians, tax collectors, uh, rich men who were at the top of the heap, poor folks who other people wouldn't touch, the prostitutes, the drunkards. Uh, and when he was dying on the cross, he, he sought the man next to him, on the cross next to him. He came to seek. You might think you found Jesus, but the truth is Jesus found you. Now what good would it be if the search party was just about finding the lost person and saying, hey, guess what? You're lost. And then leaving. He came to seek and to save. That's really the purpose of searching, right? To save the lost. Because our problem is sin. Sin has infected our mind, our will, our intellect, our moral decision-making, our reasoning, uh, our, our words, our deeds. In fact, every part of us has been impacted and affected by sin. We feel the weight of it. And here's the thing. Having found those who are stuck in their sin, Jesus doesn't seek to destroy their lives, but to save them. Look at Zacchaeus. He doesn't look up into the tree and go, you, you idiot, what are you doing? <sighs> Here comes a lightning bolt. But he calls him by name. Zacchaeus, come down. He doesn't let him perish. <laughs> he brings him to repentance. This is why Jesus came to seek and save the lost, to bring them back to a relationship with God, to fill that hole 
that is in their heart that they try and stuff everything else in to fill, to reconcile them to God through faith, to provide a way for them to have relationship with God. If that's how he viewed people, it makes me kind of wonder, what lenses am I looking through when I view people? For the last couple of weeks, I've kind of been looking at those lenses. And I'm going to be honest. There are times that I tend to look at people a lot differently than Jesus does. I start to ask questions, right? Are they going to agree with me? Do they live like I do? Uh, do they agree with me politically? We view them as enemy or allies. If you lived in Jericho, would you go stay with Zacchaeus? Would he be the guy that you hook your wagon up to? The, the challenge for me is I'm continually kind of working through this in my own life, not sizing people up, trying to figure out do you agree with me or not, but trying to view people in the lens that God views them. Where do they stand with him. And asking God, man, how can I be a part of that process to seek and to save? How do you want me to be a part of that? Earlier, I just asked you to write down a name. Someone you're like totally far from God. Someone you thought they'd never come to know Jesus. Someone you think is so self-reliant, you just can't see it. There's no way that God would move in their life. Can I let you know a little secret? We are horrible judges of this. At least I am a horrible judge of this. The people that I think would come to know Jesus oftentimes reject him. The people I think, no way. God's doing something that I can't see in their heart and in their life. And I just happen to be a part of it. Would you consider, would you consider not limiting God here? Just consider that maybe, just, just maybe, he's working behind the scenes. And he's put that name on your heart for a reason. The person you're like, there's no way. Would you even consider that God wants you to be a part of their journey? Would you even consider inviting him to either the Easter service or journey to the cross, which is so different than coming and sitting, and then inviting them to dinner or to Easter brunch afterwards. You might be amazed at what God would do through your relationship. Here's my hope. May we consider the people around us who we think are so far from God who are watching us from a distance, who are up in that tree. They don't want to get close. They don't want to be seen. May we be the ones to go and to call them by name and invite them to come down and get to know Jesus. Will you pray with me? Father God, Thank you so much for this account. God, the people that seem unreachable, and yet you work behind the scenes. Lord, I know that in a room this size and with the people under the lid and with the people that are watching online, that there are people that are listening to my voice right now that don't have a relationship with you or they've strayed from you. And God, I know, I know that you are calling their name. God, I pray that you would just give them the courage to respond. I pray that you would just give them the courage to talk to someone so that they might know that you and only you can fill that hole. God, for those of us who have been walking with you for a while, Lord, it's so hard not to look at people and go, no way, <laughs> no way. Help us to see people with your eyes this week. Help us to step in courage to invite people to have relationship with you and to get to know you. 
Now, Lord, I know I pray, I, I talk to everyone about coming to the 8 o'clock service if they don't invite anyone. God, I'm going to pray that the 8 o'clock service is empty and the other ones are packed because we would be inviting. God, make us a people who seek others and point them to you for salvation. It's in your name, Jesus. Pray these things. Amen.